Sinless perfection in this life. Is it possible? What does the Bible have to say? That's what we're going to look at in this study today. But uh, before I get started, I'm going to just tell you about an upcoming review I have that I'm going to be doing here. Some really neat things that a brother sent to me. Um, 90 true crossword puzzles. Crossword puzzles based entirely on the King James Bible. I will be doing a book review of these coming up. Uh, he had sent them before, and I didn't get it around to getting them done, you know, getting a book review done, but uh, I did get them. Brother, thank you for sending those. Uh, really, really, really neat. We we're very excited about those. So I will be doing a book review on those coming up, uh, hopefully pretty soon. I'm also doing a major study on the subject of Jack Hiles and that whole cult system out there. Um, that's taken a lot of time having to watch just hours and hours and hours and hours of video and, and reading a lot and things like that. So uh, it's going to take a lot of time to get all this stuff cut and edited and everything else. But uh, hopefully, Lord willing, it'll be out in the next few weeks. We will see. But uh, this week we're going to talk about the issue of sinless perfection. Now, if you run into certain groups, holiness groups, Nazarene groups, Church of the Nazarene, they will talk about the second work of grace. Okay? Salvation comes, and then they have the second work of grace. And at the second work of grace, the old nature is eradicated, and you don't sin anymore, is what they teach. And I want to show you where they get that from in Scripture today. And I'm going to show you, while there's truth there, there's also some things you have to be careful of. Okay, Now, let's start out here by defining two terms. Very, very important terms. Right? Webster's Dictionary, 1828. Standing, being on the feet, being erect. That's what I'm doing right now. Number two, second definition there, moving in a certain direction to or from an object. Okay. Now number three, the third definition here and the fourth def definition are the ones that we are going to be focusing on that you're going to have to keep in mind throughout this study. Number three, settled, established either by law or by custom, continually existing, permanent, not temporary. Definition number four. And there's a bunch of other stuff there under def definition number three, but I'm not going to read all that. But definition number four. Lasting, not transitory, not liable to fade or vanish. So you see, standing is something that's permanent. It's something that is fixed. It's not going to change. Right? Now, as a Christian, you have a standing that is you are sinless in Christ Jesus. Because Jesus died on the cross and he paid for your sins. So your standing when you become a child of God is you are eternally secure. You're going to go to heaven when you die. All right? That's your standing. So, and we're going to see this in the study. You are sinless in God's sight as, part, as far as standing is concerned. Now, what's the other word here? The other word is state. Number one, condition the circumstances of being uh, of a being or thing at any given time. These circumstances may be internal, constitutional, or peculiar to the being, or they may have relation to other beings. We say the body is in a sound state, or is in, it is in a weak state, or just recovered from a feeble state. I'm not going to read the rest of that, but the uh, definition there. But you see, state can change with time. Your standing in heaven is you're saved. You are sinless in God's sight. We're going to see that. Like I said, I'm going to show you the scriptures that prove this. Your standing is one thing. Your state is what you are here, what you are living like here on the earth. Okay. We're going to see about this in this study. First of, first of all, we're going to look at your standing eternally as a Christian. Turn your Bible to 1 John chapter 5, verse 18. First John chapter 5, verse 18. Okay, First John 5, 18 says, We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lieth in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God is come, and hath given us an understanding, that we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. 
This is the true God and eternal life. So what is eternal life for you as a Christian? Being in Christ Jesus. And what is that being in Christ Jesus? What does that entail? That entails he gave his perfect sinless record to you. Okay, that's salvation. We're going to see about that. Turn to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4, verse 6 through 8. Okay. Even as David also describeth the blessedness of the man unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Now, I've talked about this in other studies, but if you're new to the ministry, let me explain imputation. Okay. You're speeding in your vehicle and you lose control and you hit somebody's car, a brand new Mercedes sitting there, and unfortunately that Mercedes kind of goes coasts over and hits a little child and injures the child and, and you go and you do all these criminal acts and finally the police are there and they have you and you come to the, I'll just say it this way, you come here to, to uh, the ministry headquarters here and I'm outside with you and the police come and they say, okay, hands up. And I say, hold on a second. Um, they say, we need to see your ID to you. And instead I step in front of them and I say, let me uh, tell you what, how about I'll give you my ID? You say, you're, you're going to take action or you're going to take the responsibility for that guy's actions? Mm -hmm. Whatever they've done, put it on me. And I'm innocent. I'm standing here. I didn't do anything wrong, but you put that onto them. Let's switch positions, in other words. That's what Jesus Christ did for you on the cross. He imputed his righteousness for your sinful condition. And he switched it. So now in God's sight, when you get up there to heaven, you're in Christ Jesus. He doesn't look and say, well, let's look at your sins you've done here. boy." You know, no. Paid for at the cross. So your standing is you are sinless before God eternally. All right? That's very important. Turn next to Romans chapter 6. Romans 6 verses 1 through 11. We'll read these verses here. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein. Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? See the imputation thing there? Verse 4, Therefore we are, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also reign or live with him, uh, knowing that Christ, hath, being raised from the dead, dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God." Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. All right. Again, you see the imputation there. See, for you to get right in God's sight, you have sinned. Therefore, you have to die because of those sins. But here's the ticket. Jesus Christ died in your place on the cross. So, he died an innocent man and took your punishment that you deserve and I deserve. He took our punishment on, the, on himself on the cross to pay for those sins. So now we can walk around in God's sight and say, hey, I'm saved, I'm redeemed. I am not a sinner. All right? Why? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleansed me from all sin. You see that there? You say, well, then, then I don't ever do anything wrong. You never do anything wrong. Don't get ahead of me. We're going to talk about that. Romans chapter 8. Jump over to Romans chapter 8, verse 1 through 10. 
It says, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, and to be spiritually minded, or but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. And if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So again, you see there, your old man is crucified with Christ. All right? So you're dead to sin. You say, well, Brian, I don't understand because I still sin occasionally. Let's look at the next. Let's keep going here and you'll, you'll see how this ties in. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 18 and 19. It says here, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. That relationship that is created there, that personal relationship, in spite of what the Pope tries to say, you know, you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That personal relationship comes and God says, okay, now the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to you and now you don't have to live in sin anymore. Okay, you are dead to that old man of sin. You say, but I don't understand because there's still sin there. Right? Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. Verse 10 through 15 it says here, And ye are complete in him which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead. And you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiving, forgiven you all trespasses. All. There. Not just some. Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Now, very interesting study, and I've talked about this before in another study. I can't remember which one right now, but the point is, um, I'll just say it again here. I'll repeat it. You study the Old Testament. You can look this up. They'll say, the soul that touches this, it shall die, and the soul that touches that, and the soul that touches this. See, let me explain very quickly what, it, what the makeup of a man is. Okay, We are made in God's image. So God is three in one. Man is three in one. Man has a body, man has a soul, man has a spirit. Three parts to one man. Okay? Now, your soul is within your body. Right? I believe it's basically like a, you know, it'd be kind of like a, you take a football, so to speak. The outside is the flesh, the leather. Then you have the rubber inner tube there. That'd be like the soul. Then the air within it is the spirit. Okay? It's just one way to explain it. And... So it is with us. Your body and your soul are connected. Your spirit, before you get saved, is dead in trespasses and sins. When you get saved, it's quickened. So in the Old Testament, if you touch something that was unclean, it was affecting, your, your flesh was touching it, but it was affecting your soul. Now in the New Testament, right there, it says the circumcision that's made without hands and the operation by the, through the faith of the operation of God, verse 12, that operation 
effectively cut your soul and your flesh loose. So now, whatever your flesh touches, it's not going to affect your soul eternally. You say, well, man, this sounds like you're trying to say that we can just go ahead and live in sin, and it's not really sin, it's just, you know, whatever, whatever. We're going to see about that. Because, see, you can take this thing, and you can take it too far. And some of these Pentecostal holy, holiness types of people, they do that. I've run into some of these people. I remember we were out door to door the one time we ran into this uh, Nazarene, Church of the Nazarene guy. And uh, he was saying that he doesn't sin anymore. You know, and he was quoting these verses here and everything. And it's like, well, you know, you can quote those verses, but it's talking, those verses are all talking about eternally. Um, there is payment for sinning in this life. Let's look about that. Romans chapter 6, verse 23 very familiar verse if you do any kind of soul winning type of work Romans chapter 6 and verse 23 for the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord okay um, what are wages there's something that you earn because you worked for it now if I came in here and I brought um, five uh, cases of beer, we'll say. And I set them here, and the Bible condemns drunkenness, you know. So I set these five cases of beer here, and I say, okay, I don't sin anymore. Whatever sins happen, it's not imputed to me. I'm, my sins are paid for. They're all under the blood. I don't have to worry about it. Righteousness imputed, everything else. So... I can drink these five cases of beer right here on camera and uh, it's not going to affect me. Well, that's a partial truth. You see, it's not going to affect me eternally. I'm not going to get to heaven and the Lord's going to say, you shouldn't have drank that beer, Brian. You shouldn't have gotten drunk on camera. That's You lost your salvation. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's not going to happen. But what will happen? If I drank five cases of beer, I'd probably be dead. Uh, you know, I'd be a little bit of uh, over drinking there, you know, uh, getting drunk, certainly. Uh, no, what's going to happen is if I decide to take alcohol and get drunk, it's going to affect my body. He say, well, it doesn't matter, though, because whatever affects your body doesn't affect your soul because they're cut loose. There's that spiritual circumcision, right? Well, kind of. We'll continue here and I'll show you what I mean. You will earn wages if you sin. And the wages of sin is death. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. See, the, the temptation here among the brethren is they say, you know, they take all this stuff about imputation and everything else, our sins are paid for and it doesn't matter and everything eternally. And they say, well, see, then I can do whatever sins I want here, and it doesn't really matter. I don't have to have any kind of guiltiness or conscience or anything else because sins don't mean anything. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? If any man defile the temple of God, him shall God destroy. For the temple of God is holy, which temple ye are. You say, wait a second. If the Bible says that God doesn't judge us anymore, that He looks at us and, and He sees that we're sinless, that we have the righteousness of Jesus Christ, then how could He destroy us if we defile the temple? Well, what's being destroyed there is the temple itself, the body of flesh. Your flesh, your body right here is what God's going to punish if you're messing around with sin. That's what's going to happen. Eternally, no. No, God's not going to, He's not going to mess around with your soul and things like that. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. But He can sure mess around with your flesh here in this life. We're going to see that as we continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Here's a good one. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses uh, 28 through 32. 
says here, But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread, and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Now, of course, some of these Pentecostal people will say, they'll say, well, now, hold on a second, though. See, we got you here. Because, you know, it's not talking about saved people. They're not discerning the Lord's body there. See? So it's lost people. See, they try to say, well, it's only the lost people that have condemnation for sin, and God won't condemn you for sin if you're saved. Uh, keep reading. Verse 30, For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, saved people, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. What did we just read over there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost. If any man defile the temple, him shall God destroy. Many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. That doesn't mean you're getting a good night of sleep either. Okay, That's talking about death. God will actually kill a carnal Christian if it gets that bad. You say, well, he kills the soul? No. No. He kills the body, the flesh. You say, well, who cares? You know, because I'm going to heaven when I die, so who cares what happens to my body? Oh, you're going to need to care. And we're going to see that later on as we continue in the, into the study here. There's a very strong reason why you don't want your flesh to die too soon. Now let's look at uh, 1 Timothy chapter 1. First Timothy chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. It says here, This charge I commit unto thee, son Timothy, according to the prophecies which went before on thee, that thou by them mightest war a good warfare holding faith and a good conscience, which some having put away concerning faith have made shipwreck, of whom is Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I have delivered unto Satan, that they may learn not to blaspheme. Now, I don't believe there that Hymenaeus and Alexander were lost people. Why? You don't need to deliver people like that to Satan. Satan already has them. You know, Jesus said back there in John 8, ye are of your father the devil. So, Lost people are already belong to Satan. Okay, What's going on there? Well, these guys put away certain elements concerning their faith, and Paul just simply said, I'm not even going to bother with you people anymore. You know, I'm not even going to try to exhort you. I'm not going to try to reprove you or rebuke you or whatever. You know what? Lord, just turn them over to Satan. For what? The destruction of the flesh. Hmm? See the same thing over in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. The guy that was committing fornication with his father's wife. Paul says about whom I have delivered unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. You know, that's what's going on there. Your soul is something that is eternal. It's sealed. Your standing is fixed. But your state is something entirely different. The state of your life as a Christian down here depends on you fighting against sin. I'll show you another verse. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Just jump over, over another page or so there. 1 Timothy 4, 16. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, a lot of people try to take this verse and they say, well, see, you have to save yourself. Oh, uh, well, look at the context of it. Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Take heed unto yourself? What does that mean? Uh, if we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. That's what it means. And unto the doctrine? Continue in them. Don't back down. You say, well, everybody else is. Doesn't matter. Don't back down. Stand up against the wiles of the devil. You know, stand up against the, the world, the flesh, and the devil out there, the things that are trying to get you to, to compromise. You have to stand against those things. Don't back down. 
For in doing this, thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You know, that's another thing that you have to keep in mind as a Christian. Your actions have a direct impact on other believers. Other believers that are going through a hard time and all of a sudden they see you quit, it's discouraging to them. But if they see your courage and they see, hey, this person's really sticking with it. This brother, this sister, whoever, they're really sticking with it. It's an encouragement. You know, it's a neat thing. So there is a sense in which you can, you know, mess your life up. You can become shipwrecked, you know. And, you know, of course, what's a shipwreck? <laughs> Everything's just out there floating in the water. It's chaotic. It's, uh, you just lost a lot of things. You know, you can do that as a Christian. You can mess around with the flesh so much and mess around with sin that your life will be a mess. Falling apart. You don't want to do that. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. It says here, And ye have forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children. My son, despise not thou the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. If ye endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the Father chasteneth not? But if ye be without chastisement, whereof all are partakers, then are ye bastards and not sons. Furthermore, we have had fathers of our flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? For they verily for a few days chastened us after their own pleasure, but he for our profit that we might be partakers of his holiness. Now no chastening for the present seemeth to be joyous, but grievous. <laughs> Amen. You know. Nevertheless, afterward it yieldeth the peaceable fruit of righteousness unto them which are exercised thereby. Oh boy. You know, there's a lot of scriptures in the Bible that I don't really like very much. You know, and, that, and this is another one. You know, the thing of chastening. I remember being little and I'd do some bad things occasionally. Not very much because I was a perfect child, you know. Yeah, sure. But uh, I'd do some bad things and, and I'd be getting ready to be spanked. And my father would say to me, you'll thank me for this when you get older. And I'm always going, you know, <laughs> yeah, right. You know, I'm going to thank him for this, you know. I'm about ready to get whipped here and I'm going to get, uh, you know, I'm going to be thankful for this. You know, I remember the one time I, I tried to, to put a book in my pants back there, you know, you know, the seat of my pants there. Yeah, you know, that got me an extra spanking. So, <laughs> but you know what? I'm thankful for it now. I'm thankful that I wasn't allowed just to get away with whatever I wanted to do. I'm thankful that I was punished. You know, and my, and my parents didn't beat me or anything like that, or they weren't, you know, abusive or whatever. No, they just, you know, punished me when I needed it. And there were a lot of times I needed it. But uh, the fact is, uh, there have been times I've needed to be punished by God. There have been times uh, I've been doing wrong in the flesh, you know. And the Lord doesn't look down and say, forget about it. Hey, don't worry about it, Brian. Your sins are all paid for at the cross. You know, don't, don't worry about it. I mean, whatever. It doesn't matter. You know, this... Go on and do what you want to do. That's not a loving God. A loving God looks down from heaven and he says, wait a second. You shouldn't be looking at that on the computer there. Hey, you're coveting that. You don't need that. That's a rough one. You know, looks down and he says, you know what? You lied. Hey, why did you do that? Why did you do this? Why did you say that? And he'll chasten you. And the Bible says if you see somebody that professes to be saved there and they're without chastisement, they're a bastard. You know what a bastard is? Somebody that doesn't know who their father is. It just cracks me up. You see all these modern Christians and they say, I just don't understand the God of the Old Testament. I don't understand the God of the Old Testament. Well, it's probably because you're a bastard. And people use the word bastard. They've taken it and 
and twisted it now into profanity, you know, that you call somebody a bastard, that's profanity or something like this. You know, they do that with our, our King James Bible words all the time. And people go, well, we shouldn't say it then because it's profanity. No, hold fast the form of sound words. They took the word from us. You know, we're not going to conform to their standards. Bastard is somebody that doesn't know their father. And there's a lot of modern Christians that are bastards. They don't know their father. But the point is there, brethren, there's going to be times when the Lord's going to chasten you. Definitely. But you say, Brian, I'm sorry, I don't agree with you. I cannot sin anymore because my sins are all paid for. The first part of the sermon there, are, you know, we'll, we'll just stick with the standing. Let's not worry about the state that we're in. Okay, I am sinless. I am perfect. I do not sin. Turn in your Bible to 1 John chapter 1 in case you think that way. 1 John chapter 1. Verses 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ his Son cleanseth us from all sin. So there you see it again. But let's keep reading. Look at verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. You say, well, Brian, yeah, that's, that's talking about your past sins, your past lost, lost life. Really? Verse 8. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You say, well, yeah, that's salvation. Um, last time I checked, confessing your sins doesn't save you. Coming to God as a sinner, yeah, sure. That's one thing. You know, Come to God, say, I'm a sinner. I need to get saved. I put my faith in Jesus Christ. See? Yeah. But just coming and saying, God, uh, please, I, I can you know, confess that I did this and I confess that I did that and whatever else. You can do that until you're blue in the face. It ain't going to save you. Not until you put your faith in Jesus Christ. What's this talking about then? Verse 9. It's talking about you being in a right relationship with the Lord. You get saved, but now to stay in fellowship, you confess your sins that you're doing to God. Why? If we would judge ourselves, we should not be judged. Very, very important to get a hold of that thing. Judge yourself. That's why it's important to know your Bible. This book is like a mirror. And you look in this thing and it shows you what sins you're messing around with. And it convicts you. That's why you read... You know, or you listen to sermons and you get convicted sometimes. And you say, oh boy, I'm doing that thing there. What is that? It's the Holy Spirit speaking through me, through the pages of the Bible, zipping across to wherever you're watching this video, coming out of the page of your Bible. That's why we all need to have the same Bible, you know. Coming out of the page of your Bible and convicting you. Pricking your heart and saying, you're guilty of that. Yeah. Verse 10, if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So for those of you out there that say, you know, I don't sin anymore. I have the second work of grace and all this other stuff. You're making God a liar and his word is not in you. Uh, yes, you do sin. Yes, you can mess around with sin. And you say, what, uh, you know, still, Brian, I just, I don't know. I don't know what to think about all this. Well, let me just give you a little warning. You see, while your sins are paid for at the cross, and while your sins are not going to come up in eternity, and while your sins are you're only going to have to suffer for sins down here in a sense, there's also another sense in which your sins in this life are going to have an impact on your eternal life. Let me show you that. 1 Corinthians chapter 3. First Corinthians chapter three, verse eleven. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. 
Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now look at verse 15. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. And that doesn't mean there are times in the Bible, King James Bible, where suffer can mean allow. I suffer not a woman to teach. You know, I allow not a woman to teach. That's not what it's talking about here. Suffer as in a bad thing. He shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So God looks at you and he says, all right, you are sinless because Jesus Christ's righteousness is imputed to you. I'm not going to say, okay, hey, you sinned after you got saved, therefore you're gone. You're in hell. All right. God's not going to say that. But because of you living in sin, you were not able to live the kind of life that you should have lived that would have earned rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. So yes, your sins down here do affect you eternally. Yes, they do. Going back to my earlier analogy, five cases of beer, and I drink it up and stuff like this, and now I walk outside, and I'm walking around, and I'm stumbling around and things, and walking around and, and bumping into things, and, st and the people live in this neighborhood here see that. What kind of a witness do you think I'd have? None. Say I drive my pickup truck and I got all the bumper stickers and stuff on it and I drive out to an adult bookstore. Some guy pulls in the parking lot beside me and he gets out. If you died tonight, would you be in heaven or hell? And he looks at my truck and he goes, looks at the adult bookstore and looks back at my truck and he thinks, what's going on here? Now am I going to lose my salvation because I walked into an adult bookstore? No. But guess what? I'm going to lose my testimony. Oh, and uh, there's going to be some serious chastening coming as well. Serious chastening. The Lord's going to make some things happen in my life that aren't going to be too much fun. I've messed around with sin, I know. I speak from experience. I have the scars to prove it. You say, what, uh, God, uh, God punished your soul then, Brian? No, He punished my flesh. And there are many times that I could have been doing things for the Lord and He really couldn't use me too much because I was messing around with my flesh. And I'll tell you what, the more you give up, the more sin you give up, the more sanctified you become, the more God can use you. And the more rewards you're going to have in heaven. Very important to understand that. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy, turn to Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It says here, It is a faithful saying, For if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, that's around with your flesh in this life, he also will deny us. You say, oh no, I lost my salvation. Keep reading. Verse 13, if we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. See, you're born again, you're saved, everything's fine there. You say, but what, it said he, you know, he also will deny us. What does it mean there? He also will deny us. It means he's going to deny your rewards. He's going to deny you millennial reign. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If you don't suffer, you're not going to reign. Pretty easy to understand that. So again, you see this whole thing of, I don't sin anymore, you know, whatever I do down here, it's not counted as sin and things like this. Brethren, we need to take a very strong attitude against sin. And, you know, praise the Lord that our sins are paid for, that the righteousness, righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to us. Praise the Lord we're not going to have to go around in heaven and, and have the Lord, you know, we walk past the Lord and the Lord snubs us and, and we go, oh, Lord, what's wrong? I remember that time that you looked at that dirty picture. I'm not going to talk to you. You know, <laughs> we don't have to worry about that. That's not going to happen. 
Like I said, we're not going to get up there and the Lord's going to say, you know what, I weighed out your good works and your bad works, and your bad works outweighed your good works, so you're going to go to hell. No, that's not going to happen. But I'll tell you what will happen. You're going to get up there to heaven and you're going to be going, wow, this is great. If only I would have kept this in mind. If only I would have been more heavenly minded than earthly minded. Why did I waste so much time down there? I remember that at one time I played video games on the computer. That must have been three or four hours. Well, I sure wish I'd been out handing out tracks, looking all around, and glories of heaven and streets of gold and all these mansions and everything else. And it's going to come back, and you're going to say, "How many hours did I waste? How many years did I waste?" And a lot of people are going to get to the judgment seat of Christ, and all they're going to have is wood, hay, and stubble. We say, "What's wood, hay, and stubble?" All things that were alive and then die. Kind of like the uh, flesh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Don't serve the flesh with your life, brethren. Okay, turn next to Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. You know, we as people are kind of funny little creatures. You know, I, I remember back when I first got saved and things, and, and uh, I was 25, and, and I mean, really, truly saved. I, I thought I was saved before that, but life just didn't line up with true conversion. But, uh, you know, I remember... I was starting to study and things and read things and whatever else, and I got into the thing of the pre-trib rapture, and I realized that Jesus Christ could come back soon. And, you know, I started to think about it, and I started to think, you know, well, it's probably going to be 1993, because then you'd have seven years of the time of Jacob's trouble, and then the year 2000 would initiate the Millennial Kingdom. And I got all excited, you know, and everything else. And, and uh, actually, I wasn't saved at that point, but I was thinking 1993 back you know, as a false convert, but he didn't come. And then I thought, well, maybe it's going to be the year 2000. And, you know, so I waited for that and he didn't come. And then it was like, well, maybe the year, you know, 2011, because that'd be the 400th anniversary of the King James Bible. Ah, oh, that's it. That's going to be it. He didn't come. You know, and every year I'm like, I think this is going to be the year. I think this is going to be it now. I think the Lord's going to come back. You know, and he doesn't come, and I'm just like, ah, you know, what's taking the Lord so long? And the Lord's up there going, it's not even been two days for me yet, you know. <laughs> Since he came back up, you know, one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, Second Peter chapter 3, and it's just like the Lord's up there going, it's not even been two days, not even been 48 hours up here in heaven. Of course, there's no time there, but, you know, recollection of it, you know, it just seems like a day, a thousand years. You know, that's why the Lord says, Behold, I come quickly. He goes up and he says, oh, I'll be coming back in about two days. Down here, we're just like, wow, it's really going on this long time period. and, and But not so in heaven. And I don't mean to sound like a broken record here, but uh, I do believe the Lord's coming back soon. You know, I had a brother send me a picture of uh, these Georgia Guidestones. I'm not going to have a picture of this or anything. You can look it up yourself. But uh, there was a one area up on the one corner of one of these big stones that go up. And the stones, they have the, the Ten Commandments of the New World Order, the, the One World Coming Government. Um, very interesting stuff there. But uh, these Georgia Guidestones. And up in the one corner, there was a little space that was missing. And that little space has now been filled. Somebody put a little rock in there. And it says 2014. Makes you wonder, you know. I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what 2014, I wonder what the significance of it is going to be. You know, and I start thinking in my mind, what if this is the year of the rapture? 
You say, well, no man knoweth the day or the hour. Well, those passages there in Matthew chapter 24 are pointed doctrinally at the second coming of Christ. Um, you say, well, then people can know the day or the hour of the rapture. No, I don't believe that. But uh, there could be some talk going on in heaven. People could see, you know, these devil spirits and things up there. They could, you know, be starting to see some things that are going to happen. I don't know. You say, are you predicting the rapture for 2014? Sure. I think it'd be great. <laughs> you know, you say, what if it doesn't happen? Then I'll predict it in 2015. Then I'll predict it in 2016 if it doesn't happen after that. You know, I believe the Lord's come back soon. I'm looking for his coming. I'm anxious for his coming. And what am I going to do? Well, hold that fast which thou hast. Say, well, they just came out with a new version, Brian. I don't care. I'm going to hold fast to what I have. Well, Brian, there's this, this brand new thing that just came out here and it's so much better than the way you do things. No, I'm going to hold fast. Well, you know, you really need to update your uh, uh, beliefs on such and such. No. Hold fast what thou hast, that no man take thy crown. I'll grant you, I haven't worked very hard for a crown. Some people might be surprised to hear me say that, but uh, there were a lot of times I've wasted time, especially early on in the ministry. I was pretty much uh, addicted to video games way back when, and, and uh, thankfully the Lord and, and my wife you know, helped me to get away from all that and everything. I was pretty much not playing them much anymore when we first got married, but, you know, I'd occasionally I'd just go into this neutral gear, you know, because I'd do a whole lot of work, and I'd be just like, I'm just going to play a game or something like that. I wasted time, you know. And I had a lot of junk that I needed to get rid of and things. I still have things I need to get rid of, still have areas I need to sanctify and, and get closer to the Lord. And there are still times I sin. And I need to confess those sins to the Lord. And I'm not going to walk around pretending that I'm somehow sinless because I'm sinless in eternity. I judge myself down here. I keep myself judged. And when I mess up, I don't spend a whole lot of time staying away from, you know, talking to the Lord about that. You know, and I've always said this in other studies, and I'll say it one more time, and that is the best thing that you can do like the old uh, colored woman said, when it comes to sin, I fess them as I does them. I confess it as I do it. You mess around with sin, excuse me, there's a little bug flying around. You mess around with sin, confess it. You do something wrong, you don't go, oh, well, you know, I am, you know, sinlessly perfect because of, you know, the imputed. No, no. You know it's wrong. You say, I'm going to judge myself. Lord, I shouldn't have looked at that. I'm sorry, Lord. I shouldn't have done that. You know, you get so tempted on the Internet. I know, boy, the temptations, I'll tell you. You see something and you go to click on it and the Lord says, don't watch that. Don't click on that. Click. Page loading comes up. The Lord says, you still have time to get off of this page. Don't stay on here. You know what you need to do? You need to listen to the Lord. Close that page out. Lord, I'm sorry for even clicking on that page. That was really stupid. I shouldn't have done a thing like that. You know what you're doing? You're judging yourself. Why? So God doesn't have to. You know what's right and wrong in here. And you have the Holy Spirit to bear witness with your spirit. There have been many times I couldn't have even given you a scripture right in the situation I was in, but the Lord spoke to me in my heart and said, stop, don't do that. You know, and of course it does line up with scripture. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not trying to, the Holy Spirit speaks to me in ways that the Bible doesn't say. No, I'm not saying that. I'm just simply saying at times I couldn't even think of a scripture to prove that such and such is wrong, but I just get the Holy Spirit saying, bearing witness and just making me feel very uneasy. You know, do you ever go into a store or some other place and you walk in there and you just feel like, yeah, you know, I shouldn't be in here. And you don't even know why. You don't even know why. You don't even know what the deal is. You know what the best thing that you can do is? Listen to the Lord. Get out of there. 
You mess around with some kind of sin, confess it, forsake it, move forward. That's very, very important. And I'll tell you what, you know, this, this thing of this Georgia Guidestones thing, the 2014 and, and whatever else, you know, I will say this, it's just kind of like I see the levels of control here on YouTube and I see uh, this all these different groups. I see the sodomite agenda getting worse and worse and worse and I see the Catholics getting more and more control and the, the Muslims and this ISIS thing and all this stuff. They're getting more and more powerful, and I see all oh, atheism is going up and up and up, you know, and they're getting more and more powerful, and they're and they're starting to get more and more hateful of the Bible and Christians. And it's just like you can feel the enemies just kind of coming in and just kind of like this. And yet there's something just kind of withholding, kind of a letting, you know. And it's like, can you imagine what's going to happen when the rapture hits? And all of a sudden, all of us wackos leave and they perceive it as us doing some kind of a mass suicide or something like this. Can you imagine what they're going to be able to pull off just like that? Shut our accounts down, come in, confiscate every all of our belongings and whatever else. Deem us as terrorists and anybody who is friendly with us or think of converting to our beliefs. Enemies of the state, enemies of the New World Order, you know. We're getting close, brethren. We're getting real close. <laughs> and that's why I'm, I'm saying this specifically for a reason. I'm not saying this so that you just are like, oh man, I'm just going to sell everything I have and just go up on the top of a mountaintop and just sit there and look up at the sky. No, 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 no. Stay busy with your life. Stay active in things. You know, enjoy your life. That's that's not a sin to enjoy life. I mean, you go outside, you know, stop and smell the roses, as they say. You go outside, you say, wow, Lord, this is a beautiful day. And, and boy, that was a good meal we had last night or, or whatever. There's nothing wrong with that. The Bible says in everything, give thanks. But keep those sins judged. Don't be right in the middle of a sin when the Lord catches you away. You know, I heard that one time. That was so convicting to me. What website is going to be on your computer when the rapture happens? Ooh. <laughs> How about that one? Brian down there, come up hither. Uh, and you go to click the, I want to close that page real quick. Dang, going to be time. The Bible says in a moment, the twinkling of an eye. <laughs> Quicker than that. Quicker than you can snap your fingers like that gone. There won't be time. There won't be time to say, oh, I should take that DVD out. Well, I shouldn't be on that web page. You're going to be leaving. And whoever comes to your house is going to find that website on your computer. Or they're going to find that DVD in your DVD player. Or they're going to find that whatever. Magazine there that you were reading. Book that you were reading. You see, the rapture is a purifying hope. You want to be found faithful. Why? So that you can be crowned. You say, well, Brian, I, I've, I've messed up my life. I've done so many things wrong and so many things bad. It just, I'm not going to have much rewards. Well, a lot of us can say that. But you can start over today. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Move forward. Say, well, you know, I only I only got two days of real service in for you, Lord, but uh, better than nothing. Something to think about. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I just... I thank you so very much for the blood that you shed on that cross, for the fact that we can know that we have our sins paid for, Lord. We don't have to worry about maybe we won't make it when we get to heaven. Maybe we'll get up there and we'll be judged and we'll be sent to hell instead. Uh, it's such a blessing, Lord, to know that our sins are paid for and that your righteousness has been imputed to us, Lord, and we are so undeserving of that. And that's why we thank you so much for it. But uh, Lord, I just pray that anyone out there would not fall for this trap, this lie that 
They don't have to think about sin. They don't have to judge themselves. They don't have to, to be concerned and confess sins to you. Um, I pray, Lord, that all of us would sanctify our lives and just listen to your Holy Spirit and listen to the promptings of your word uh, to convict us of the sins that we need to get rid of in our lives. And my prayer, Lord, for everyone out there is that we would all be found faithful when you do catch us away, Lord. And I do pray that that would happen soon. As many good things have happened in my life and as much joy as I have sometimes, uh, nothing will compare to that time when we will get to all meet and have fellowship and not have to worry about anybody evil getting in there or whatever else will be with you. We'll be with each other and all the saints down through history. It'd just be wonderful. Lord, I do pray that that would happen soon. And uh, I just ask it all in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Alrighty. It's kind of a shorter study today, but like I said, um, have uh, this other study that's kind of, you know, really taking a lot of time and um, just... Some really incredible stuff I'm going to be bringing out and very, very important information to get out there. So i got to get back to working on that. Of course, a lot of things, there's always the, the, the physical, you know, things. I mean, it's always a struggle um, between the spiritual and the physical. You know, I think to myself, you know, if the Lord's coming back, you know, do I really need to do housework, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, should I do the dishes? Maybe he'll be coming tonight. I won't have to, you know. I think of things like that, you know. But so you got to do some of that stuff, brethren. I mean, you, you know, I'm not going to go out and, and landscape, beautifully landscape around the ministry headquarters here or anything like that. No. But uh, on the same token, i got to mow the yard. You know, I have to keep things from falling apart. And you say, well, who cares if the Lord's coming back? Well, you know, there are some things that are, are necessary. And you just got to sort through that stuff, brethren. Um, so I just wanted to thank everybody, too, for praying about the censorship thing. Um, it's I saw a comment on one of the videos here recently, and I thank, thank you for making the comment. Somebody said that I've been censored for years now, basically, and they were saying that, you know, the video views that I have are not reflective of the kind of quality of videos that are put out here on this channel. And I thank you for making that statement because we put a lot of time into the videos. I mean, I have professional, you know, music. I have animation. I'm not going to get it down. I have it over here on this other shelf. But, you know, I've put thousands of dollars into this ministry. And, you know, it just it just has always kind of disturbed me. I'll see people and they have you know, they'll do a video with their web cameras or something like this. And, you know, I'm running what we call prosumer cameras, you know, high definition, you know, stuff. And, and uh, you know, <clears throat> they're getting 10, 20,000 views per video and I'm getting, you know, just over a thousand. And <clears throat> that's always kind of bothered me. Not because I want numbers and I want to, you know, pat on the back or anything like that. But it's just bothered me because I know that, numbers are being messed around with and things and and there have been many times i remember there was a time it went for about a month i think it was last year uh last year in the summertime about june july somewhere in there it went for about a month and there were no updates on my um, channel views the total views i mean it was just like this is ridiculous and it finally kind of went up a little bit but not reflective of, of what's going on. And I've noticed too, there have been times where a video is really going well and it just goes and just stops and just there's no more views and nothing is happening. Even there's, there's lots, of, lots of comments and people back and forth and things, but the video views don't really do anything. And, and you know, I've been on six for roughly six years now and still don't have one video that's gone over 100,000 views. And yet I see these videos of people not even close to, I'm not trying to brag, I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but not even close to the kind of quality that I put out, and they're getting 100, 200,000 views. And I'm thinking, you know, <laughs> uh, something's a little bit rotten in Denmark, if you know what I mean, you know. So, 
it's it's just to be expected. I mean, the kind of controversial stuff that we're putting out here, I don't expect to uh, not be censored. Um, it's just going to happen. Uh, what is going to happen if my channel gets shut down? Uh, I've had a lot of people say, well, I should have a backup channel and all this stuff. I do have another channel that I've used just for uh, you know, personal use and things, uh, family types of stuff, or like if I have something I need to sell. Um, like I had a motorcycle the one time I needed to sell, just a little dual sport motorcycle. And I made a video of it for a guy that was interested and he was going to be coming hours away. And so I just put the video on that other channel and uh, just just do stuff like that, you know, with that other channel. But for me to take the time to re-upload everything onto that channel, I just can't do it. There's just no way. It would tie up my computer and, you know, it just, I, I, I couldn't do that. I mean, the, the area we live in, you know, we get power outages here fairly frequently. And so, you know, if I have a computer that's just running nonstop trying to upload video, it's going to get messed up periodically. So it just... I can't have a mirrored channel exactly the way I have it right now, you know, and that's why it's important, you know, and I'm thankful to everybody out there that, that mirrors my videos and puts it onto your own channel with a different name because, see, then the, the whole Google system, it kind of is a, a loophole there, and they can't, you know, if they're just taking my video, my unique video with the title and everything like that, you know, they'll be able to get rid of that stuff, but if they're if it's being downloaded and then re-uploaded with a different name, I think it can preserve it a little bit longer like that. So um, thank you to everybody that's doing that. I pray for the Lord's blessing upon you for doing that. Um, but, you know, I don't know. I'm, I'm open to different suggestions. I know we still have sermon audio uh, that that uh, I can probably still, you know, stay on there. Uh, the brother that takes care of that for me. Um you know, I'm not sure exactly how to do video through that. If there's another player other than YouTube, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any kind of video limit there. Uh, it's been a long time since I was on Sermon Audio, you know, for myself through Bible Believers Fellowship. Uh, so that's a, another thing. Uh, my own website, KingJamesVideoMinistries.com. It has a video player, but it's probably not a very good video player and it would probably crash the site you know if, if uh, you know like a Sunday morning if everybody was getting on there to watch the video or whatever so you know not really sure what to do yet uh, with the whole thing you know definitely praying about everything here and, and uh, I don't know um, I often just say about you know being persecuted and things and and because I realized that it could it could happen to the point where you know they start to silence the preachers in America uh, that's happened in other countries it could certainly happen here and uh, if that happens obviously you know I'm thinking to myself do I just go up until that time period and end up in a camp someplace or whatever um, go to prison or something like that uh, you know, I have a problem with the, the thing of modern day prisons because they are uh, filled with sodomites. It'd be one thing to go and be tortured for Christ and, and you know, go and be whipped or beaten or something like that. That's bad enough. But, you know, perverts, uh, sexually deranged perverts in those places, I don't really know if it's God's will for me to go to a place like that or any other Christian for that matter. So, you know, it, it's all just stuff that runs through my mind. I'm just kind of letting my mouth ramble right now. <laughs> but uh, it's it just, it is weird to see the persecution kind of ramping up. I've had two people now tell me that there are ads being put on my salvation message. Real nice. You know, so I guess YouTube is just like, eh, we don't care. You don't want to monetize, we'll do it. You know, we'll just put our ads on. We won't pay you anything. We'll just make the money ourselves. You know, well... They're going to answer for that. And, you know, I've had other people say, too, that this Mark Tilbury that was impersonating me and using my name, you know, might have actually been working for the NSA or Google or one of these organizations or something like that. Well, if that's true, and if you're watching Mark Tilbury, you're going to answer before God. 
And I know you can laugh about that. People, you know, within the government system are so prideful and arrogant right now. They don't, they don't think that God even exists or things. You're going to see. You'll see. And uh, you silence the preachers out there. You silence those of us that preach the Word of God. You're going to see evil come upon you and upon this nation. And, you know, I'm not the key to the whole thing. And, you know, I'm God's special spokesman for the whole world or something like that. No, no. I'm just one of many. But you start to... You start to actively persecute Christians. You'll see how it goes. So, I think that's enough rambling for right now. Um, Got to get back to work on my other video project. Uh, I, I'm trying, essentially what I'm trying to do, just to give you a little idea of, of the future direction of the ministry, assuming that I can stay on YouTube and my channel doesn't get shut down. Uh, what I want to do is I'm just going to do periodic little short studies like I did today, um, uh, covering just a Bible topic. I've got a lot of them covered now, so I don't want to overlap, preach the same sermon twice or anything. But I want to do little Bible subject type studies and occasionally come out with a more detailed documentary where I'm actually showing a lot of you know video clips and everything else there. Now, I want to say that too, by the way, the thing of the copyright violations, I know some of you have said, well, just contest it and things. I forgot to mention that in the video when I was talking about YouTube censoring my channel. I have contested these copyright violations. Uh, they just keep coming back. <laughs> and I'm just like, I already had this thing covered. I already filed the claim and I went through, you know, USC section 107, fair use clause, the United States copyright law says for educational purposes, for nonprofit educational purposes, I am allowed to use this. It's not a derivative work. I go through the whole thing and they take down the, you know, copyright violation thing and then they, they bring it back up again. So, you know, I mean, if I was uploading, you know, videos of, of popular modern day things and, and perverse things and whatever else, I could use all the copyrighted material I want. But you start to, you know, do some things that ruffle some feathers, well, you've, you're violating copyright law, even though I'm not. You know, redefine what the law means, I guess, if you work for Google and YouTube. So, well, I guess that's going to be it. I'll quit yapping here. So, thank you to everybody that prays for the ministry. Thank you for those who donate. Thank you for uh, the, the comments, both good and bad. I always enjoy looking at some of the comments. Can't always respond to everybody. Uh, just very, very busy. But uh, please keep us in your prayers. And we will see you. Not sure when I'm going to get the other study done, the one on Jack Hiles, but... Uh, We'll see. And not sure what I'm going to be talking about next week either. There's a, there's a couple different ones. I haven't written the, the uh, notes for it yet. So, But we will see you soon, Lord willing. Uh, Lord willing, I'll be around another week. Um, but my greatest hope and desire would be for the rapture to happen soon. Uh, I know that there have been some that have talked about late September, you know, the Feast of Trumpets or whatever, and it's like we're, we're getting close to that. So... You know, I'm kind of, I always get kind of, you know, kind of watching, you know, and I'm kind of like, maybe it'll be late September, you know, and then Song of Solomon, it talks about in the springtime, you know, uh, the bride hears the voice of her beloved, you know, and he says, rise up, my love, my fair one, come away, you know, and uh, so, you know, I kind, of, I kind of get excited in the springtime, kind of like, maybe this is it, uh, uh, now we're in the summer now, and now I'm like late September, and I'm going, maybe again, <laughs> You know, and of course he could come back at any time. I don't, I don't really know, but uh, we'll see. We'll see if the 2014 thing happens, comes to pass. I hope it does, because I'm about sick and tired of this wicked world, and I'd love to see all of you and meet you face to face, and we can be together then, as the body of Christ. It'd be great. So that's going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.